So you're in for a treat. In February of 2018, I met Professor Carl George. I was announced in Memorial Chapel as the 19th president of Union College, and I bumped into him, I think it was out here, and he said, I want to give you a tour of the knot. And I said, sure, as much to, you know, be nice to a new colleague as anything else. And then after several months, found time and schedules aligned, and I got this tour. Along on the tour with me were a new staff member in the library and a student, maybe first year, second year at most. I don't think any of us were quite sure what we were in for. I'm not sure the student even realized why she was there. She'd been pulled along from somewhere. But I have to say that um, it was a great gift that Professor George gave me that day because the many times I've been in this building since, I've already saw the difference between before and after hearing from Carl George about this space. I liken it to you know, reading a piece of literature, seeing a piece of art, hearing a piece of music before and after you've engaged with an expert. You know, you heard it before, you saw it before, you read it before, but it's just a different experience afterwards and you understand it more fully. Background, just a little bit. So Professor Carl George came to Union College in the fall of 1967. He came after teaching at the American University in Beirut and I understand quite an interesting story of being evacuating during the Six Day War, uh, getting out of there and coming here. And that was really our gain. He joined our biology department and along with his late wife, Gail, who was a noted dancer and actress, she made decades of positive contributions to this community. Among the many accomplishments, is Twitty Styles here? Twitty's able with us today. Among the many accomplishments, he and his wife, along with Twitty Styles, also a longtime uh, bio faculty member here at Union College, and his wife, Dr. Constance Glasgow, founded UNITAS. It was announced when Carl retired in 1997. So Carl's continued to be a very active figure around campus. I wasn't quite sure he was retired when I first got here. And I thank him for everything he's done for Union and for this gift as well of sharing his great knowledge of the Knott Memorial with all of us. Thanks. Something secret in this box for the president. <laughs> All right, open thank it you. Later? I'll open it later. All right. All right thank oh, you. you can open it now if you if you can get it open. That's the. Some it's hard. Oh, there we go. A rock. And in it is a rock. <laughs> and that rock should be a symbol for something emerging and very important. So. Put it away and All think right. about it. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a stick in front of me, and I want to transform this stick over the next three or four hours. Uh, I'll hope to be done with this by noon, or not by dinner, so be patient. Okay. Uh, this is a very, very special uh, event for me. I have fallen in love with this building over the years, and uh, that romance uh, continues. Uh, there is a wonderful Latin saying that Charlie, Casey, and I enjoy. It is, in gairum imus nacte et consumumur igni. And I know it so well that I can even say it backwards. <laughs> Would you like to hear it backwards? In gairum imus nacte et consumumur igni. It is one of the most beautiful palindromes of significant length. And we still do not know the author of it. But in gairum imus nacte, we circle in the darkness et consumimur igni, and we are ignited by fire, or we gain passion. And that's very appropriate for me <laughs> and this building. But let me start off with a dedication. I'm dedicating uh, the, today's event to the women of Union College. The women of Union College are not always mentioned, but you have played such an important role and will continue to do so. I wonder how many of you know the name Gertrude Tibbetts 
peoples. I suspect very few do, but she was Eliphalet Nott's second wife, and she contributed most of the money to buy the 250 acres of land up here on Niskoyana, which means, incidentally, Corn Hill. We're all sitting in a cornfield, slightly modified. But isn't that remarkable? This woman made a major contribution to this college, and uh, she is revered. Another very important woman is Margaret Dyson, D-Y-S-O-N. Margaret Dyson played a major role in the restoration of this building by providing nine, no, five, about five million dollars out of our total, you know, our total um, enterprise of 11 million dollars. And then there is one lovely woman who adds color to this campus almost every day. And that is, she's on campus and she's actually here. Connie, where are you, dear? There she is. I suspect most of you have seen Connie in one place or another, but she is the one who brings floral delight to Union's campus. And in memory of her, um, I have two objects here. And Connie, would you come up, dear, and pick these up? It take you just a, this is so you can also better see her. Uh, but Connie adds color to union. And thus I'm giving two of my little collages to Connie. And if you can talk with Connie afterwards and hold these in the bright sunlight on some sunny day, <laughs> you will see a remarkable transformation. So these are yours, dear. They come from my home. There are 16 leaves, which is somehow related to this whole event. So thank you, dear. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Good. But when you come in, you know, the pain gate, there are always flowers. There she is. She's adding color you know, to our lives every day. There are other uh, wonderful people involved here. One who has helped me so much in defining of the colors here. Um, his name is Walter Hatke. Have you ever heard of that name, Walter Hatke? Absolutely amazing artist. Are you here, Walter? Right here. <laughs> Walter Hatke um, helped me with the colors that we'll be talking about in the dome of the Knott Memorial. And uh, they are very, very important. And incidentally, all of the little windows called illuminators up there, you know, have a little colored, a little colored uh, uh, ring in them. And all of those are preserved in our archives. So if you ever want to see what was up here before the restoration, uh, go to archives. They are there. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, is J J John, are you here today? Oh, there he is in the back. John, thank you for coming. One of the great contributors to our understanding of this building. Oh, don't worry. No, no, don't you dare worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> John Meesek is the author of this very important work. It is stand, one of the standouts in terms of the description of a historically in building. This is called simply the Knott Memorial. I have beaten up, no, annotated this one to such a degree that John took, took uh, what? Uh, patience with me and gave me a brand new bound copy. But this one brings back wonderful memories and it is a masterpiece.
So, John, thank you for being here. Thank you for this, and thank you for your contribution. Because in it are the detailed descriptions of this building, which exceed in all others. Now, let's talk a little bit about the historically important events the resulting in the production of this building. Eliphalet Knott, president of Union from 1804 to 1866, that's 62 years president. And in the back of our room here is this great portrait by Inman of Eliphalet Knott. And so um, as, you, as you leave, as you uh, uh, pass by on some future time, look more closely because it is symbol laden. And that might raise the question, what the hell is a symbol anyway when you get right down to it? But it is symbol laden. You'll see that in his right hand, he holds a sheaf of papers. You might look and see the sheaf of papers there. Do you see it? Eliphalet Knott was a notable contributor to the American, American Industrial Revolution. He developed, through his 34 patents, some, I don't know how many thousands of, of stoves that could burn anthracite coal. Ones that were on ships, such as the Novelty, which was one of the fastest ships on the Hudson River, to those which are in your home, to those which were used in industry. The anthracite coal was so hard to burn, it didn't have a sufficient oxygen supply by the conventional methods, that he developed the techniques for to use anthracite coal. And so down in the lower left, which is usually missed, there is a red figure which is another example of a signal. As you turn back, you cannot see it. You almost need a flashlight to look at it more closely. But there, there is a red figure of a goddess with a helmet with a glass shining light on a cauldron of stones. And next to the stone is a kneeling figure with a miner's pick to his right. And underneath it, there is Latin essentially saying, man must join with nature for progress. Take a look at that if you can find it. I don't know if you were standing, you two were standing. Can you see it up there, those who are, who are close to it? Do you see it? Yeah, most mi people miss that. But a very important set of symbols there. But now also on the window sill. The window sill, what do you see there? Hold too close. What do you see? A book. Any idea? I'm going to sit down now. Any idea on why Mr. Inman would put a book on the shelf? No ideas. Well, this is the book. The textbook, actually it was published in three volumes, but Inman took a shortcut and produced only one. And incidentally, there were six different editions of it during Inman's, during uh, uh, the author's life, and 40 subsequently. But this book was the textbook in one of the greatest courses that we have ever taught here at Union College. It was simply called Kames, or Elements of criticism, elements of criticism. It was a course that was so famous that students came to just to Union to take that course. You can check uh, Wayne Summers' encyclopedia to uh, get another reference to that. But an amazing, amazing uh, book. And uh, he taught it in South College up on the second floor, just uh, uh, maybe 100 yards and 100 feet away from the offices 
of the emeritus center. Beloved, beloved, uh, retry, re, replace, what do you want to call it, place of uh, study that I still have and for which and my colleagues up there greatly appreciate Union College. We're one of the few colleges who has such a retirement center. I have a colleague, a roommate uh, with me in the front row and perhaps several others out there. But at any rate, that is an important book, very important in the history of the college, and that is a symbol. Now, he is also pulling, or the carpet, it's not the carpet, the drapery is pulled to the side to show you a building. The building follows the idea of Ramey, the great French landscape architect who worked with Eliphalet Knot to produce this campus, one of the first landscape campuses in America. Incidentally, Jefferson is purported to have somewhat copied that idea for the University of Virginia. And one also where John Misick, so with us, has most recently worked on its restoration. Is that right, John? I hope you're finished. You're finished. But um, John did a wonderful job on the, late, the uh, University of Virginia restoration. Well, there are more things in that. That is what we would call Romanesque, the style there. But the building that we're in is American High Victorian Gothic, as produced by Edward Tuckerman Potter and his half-brother, William Appleton Potter. Now, Edward Tuckerman Potter was grandson of Eliphalet Knott, okay? And that was significant. And he, uh, well, I, I, I think Edward Tuckerman Potter it's only well understood if you go out and look at the various buildings that he has done. Sarah Landau is a great reference if you want to learn more about the American High Victorian Gothic. Sarah Landau is now retired, but Google Sarah Landau and see that she wrote for her PhD a dissertation on these two and their works. And so, that helped me. It helped Dr. Robert Uzo, who is now a prominent uh, surgeon, and Danny Robbins, Daniel Robbins of our fine arts department, now no longer with us, to indeed put together sort of a tour that Bob and I followed to look at the buildings that Edward Tuckerman Potter had designed and executed across the country. Now, there's an interesting thing. You can see the typical Potteresque in the first Dutch Reformed Church on Lower Union Street. I'm sure most of you know that, that building. First Dutch Reformed, Lower Union, as you drive down the hill on the right side. That is the more proper or fully, fully evolved Potteresque. But all of his buildings, or most of his buildings, there are some private homes which he did do not have, all have got a round circle, a circle, with a five-pointed star in it. We would find them here and there and so on. And I finally said to John, John, Bob and I have looked all over for the five-pointed star, and we cannot find it at Knott Memorial. And John said, well, have you ever looked closely at the illuminators? Those little windows way up there. There is a five-pointed star on each one of them. You need your binoculars when you come back to see them properly. But they are there. Five-pointed stars and six-pointed stars. The slating example shows 32 six-pointed stars. In the classic symbolary, the six-pointed star speaks to the divine order of the macro universe. And the five-pointed star is to divine an exquisite order of the microcosm. 
I had not really realized that. When I came to Union, I was rather surprised. I didn't understand that this was Hebraic institution because there were the Hebrew texts and there were the, the stars of David. But they're there because one had one of the most amazing faculty members, and perhaps, perhaps some of you have heard of him. His name is Taylor Lewis. Any of you heard of Taylor Lewis? Oh, read, learn about Taylor Lewis at Union. He was an amazing philosopher. He had full control of at least 20 languages. He, for 14 years, read the Old Testament in Hebrew. He could write Arabic exquisitely. He could write Arabic so beautifully. And this thing brings us now to a sad part of the Taylor Lewis story. Taylor Lewis's daughter, Marguerite, married Elias Peisner, P-E-I-S-S-N-E, -E, Elias Peisner. And Elias Peisner was Polish. He, after training at that particular time, each male student at Union and at faculty had to have competence with a musket, have so many pounds of lead shot in their care, and black powder. And we were trained, they were trained, to use this appropriately by Elias Peisner. The Union College Zoaves, really very important in that regard. And so Elias Peisner went off and died one of the first deaths at Chancellorville during the Civil War. Taylor Lewis was brokenhearted, and Taylor Lewis then produced, with his mastery of languages, a small booklet, eulogy to um, Peisner, and it is one of Union's most precious gifts and one that so very few of you see. So if you ever have the opportunity, visit our archives and ask to see Taylor Lewis's eulogy to Elias Peisner in our special collections. He has extracted various important statements from the Hebraic, the Syriac, the Aramaic, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, all in this little book. One of the remarkable, remarkable things that uh, we here have at Union. But returning to a Lifflet knot, he had amazing skills beyond his oratory, beyond his writing. He joined us in 1804, and that was the year in which he pinned a magnificent document decrying the, the dis disgusting death of, by Aaron Burr of Alexander Hamilton. And that writing, I think, really caught the attention of our board. He was joined, he was asked to join as our president in 1804. And of course, he survived until 1822. But he also spoke. He spoke so potently, so beautifully, so well. But he also had a sensitivity. When Alexander, not when, when Audubon, John Audubon, in his prime, visited Union College in 1844, he met with Eliphalet Knott. And at that time, Eliphalet Knott, Presbyterian minister, inventor, had the good sense to buy Audubon's last copy of his birds. He paid a thousand dollars, a whole thousand dollars for that last copy. And today, and this is sort of secret, so don't tell anybody, it is appraised at more than 10 million. I think that's a good presidential investment, wouldn't you say? <laughs> but it is in our library, our archives, and so few of you have ever seen that in the flesh, the original. And it is one of the most best, archi best archive uh, birds, I think, in America. It is beautifully, beautifully curated, thanks to our archivists. It is a masterpiece that I used in the several courses that I taught, that Walter and I used in our teaching of a wondrous course called 
What, Roger? I mean, what, uh, uh, Walter? The Illustrated Organism. The Illustrated Organism. It was a great course. We had great fun, and uh, it is still being taught periodically by our department. So uh, for, a, uh, uh, for him to have had the good sense to buy this was wonderful. And there's also a bit of shame attached to that portrait. Edmund was commissioned to paint this painting for $1,000. He was given a $300 down payment, and the college, during its financial straits, was unable to finally pay Edmund's destitute wife the remaining $700, and Eliphal and Nod paid that off. So he paid off his own memorial portrait, which is a little bit of a shame, but uh, still part of the part of the wonderful story. Well, Potter and Taylor Lewis produced this building. We give a lot of attention to it. And with Taylor Lewis's amazing linguistic skills, he contributed this Hebrew saying. Now, I wonder, is there anyone here who is fluent in Hebrew? No, 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 nobody. I had hope I was going to find somebody to read it for me. Okay. Well, it goes like this: Hayom katsar, hamlaka meruva, askar harva, ahodan dokak. The day is short. The task is great. The rewards are ample. And the Lord is urgent. Now, the original was master, but Taylor Lewis lifted it to Lord Ahodan. And uh, lest you leave with the notion that I am familiar with Hebrew, this is the only Hebrew that I know. <laughs> but I have been tutored by my um, Hebrew speaking friends. And uh, um, Taylor Lewis um, was a master of Hebrew. Master of the Old Testament. I think I may have mentioned that he read it once a year for 14 years. He had much of the Old Testament memorized. But the New Testament also enters. And the number seven, the number seven of all numbers emerges in the New Testament. The word seven occurs 212 times in the, our Bible. It occurs in the New Testament, Revelations, 30 sometimes. That was by John. And I have with me Oh! <sighs> A piece of wood that I've harvested from the knot, from, from the Mohawk River, sort of speaking the flow of things. And in this, on this piece of wood, which I'm going to pass around because each of you should be able to touch this in the process, there are nine stars, three, three, and three, and, and then a single one here, surrounded by a U shaped array of seven. I know many of you cannot quite see. Three, 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 and one, and seven. These, or this, is the arrangement of the illuminator. If you look up, can you see the groups of three up there? You see the three, 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 and then as you move down, a single. And now, because in, uh, the illuminators are now thicker than they used to be, can you pick out three, 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 and surrounded by seven? Takes a little bit of work, but there they are. Now, seven is demonstrated here, speaks to John's revelations because in John's revelations you have the seven churches of Asia Minor, which John was to instruct, instruct, and perhaps bring together. 
and so seven. And of course, union, the name union, is that of non-denominational Christian union. <laughs> sort of nice. But the number seven goes on and on and on. And if you look in the, in the right time, the right late, you can see the seven colors of Newton's spectrum. You remember them? Roy G. Biv? Roy G. Biv? And do you also remember how many notes there are in the musical scale? Seven. And Newton, who was one of Knott's heroes, one of Knott's heroes, selected seven for the number because of the seven notes in the musical scale that Pythagoras, Pythagoras put together so very long ago, listening to the hammering of metal workers. How in the world do you get from the hammering of metal workers to seven notes of the spectrum? But read on Pythagoras and you will see you know, how he has done this. Just an amazing thing. Now, how am I doing for time here? What's my time? I think I got a couple more minutes, don't I? All right. Yes, I do. Thank God. Now, I'm going to pass this around. Nine muses. I don't know how many of you could name the nine muses and the seven. But nine emerges as a very important number as well. And Holly started off there. Uh, Eliphalet Knot was the ninth of nine children. Isn't that fun? How many letters in the word eliphalet? Nine. Oh, isn't that fun? But nine also is intimately connected with the number seven. The Pythagoreans adored their numbers. Numbers were sacred to them. And they used points rather than wiggles like the Romans and we use today. But points were so important. And one of the most sacred arrays that the Pythagoreans had was the tetractus. Tetractus. It is four points or four, which is a result of one, standing for all the points of the universe, two lines, three surfaces, and four three dimensions. And when you look at the illuminators from the right view up there, you can see there's a set of four in each of the 16 sections. Now I speculate that that is the Tetractus of Pythagoras. Now don't let me carry you away because sometimes my concepts uh, are conjectural. The whole issue here, of course, is how do you link causal relationships in very capricious uh, coincidental ones. But nine is an important number. And so when you go home, let me give you a little bit of homework. Take the number one and divide it by seven. You get a number. Take the number two and divide it by seven. And you get a number. Do it for three, do it for four, do it for five. You don't have to do it by seven. Eight, nine. And in it, there is a cycling number, 14, 28, 57. And the digital root, that is when you take a set of numbers and reduce them to a single digit, digital root, the digital root of that sacred number generated by seven is nine. Wonderful. Try that on your computer at home or whatever. Divide one by seven, two by seven, and so on. Now that's a lovely way of of playing with numbers. But let me give you another bit of homework. And, and that is, take any two numbers. David, give me a number. Three. three. Holly? Twelve. Okay, if you take three and twelve and add them together, what do you get? Fifteen. 
If you take 12 and 15 and add it, you get another number, right? Develop, do that nine times, okay? Nine times. No matter where you start, whatever numbers you start with, okay? Take the penultimate number and divide it by the last number, and you come up with the value of 0.618. No matter where you start, it all comes up to be 0.618. Try it, if you disbelieve me on that. And so, let's take a look at my magic stick. Is there anything sort of, besides this, of course, which speaks um, to those whisks over there on the table, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Is there anything unusual about this? Come on. Yes, the white, the white. Now that white divides this line into a wonderful array. The ratio of this length to this length okay, is the same as this length to the whole stick. This is to this as this is to the whole. And that is the divine proportion. Luke, Luke, uh, Pacioli and, and others. That is the divine proportion, which is 0 0.618. And when you go and do your summational series, you'll find 0 0.618. Now, how is that relevant to the Knot Memorial? Well, if you consider this the span of the dome, the span of the dome up there, you understand what I'm saying? And you take a big compass and you put one end of the compass here and the other here and sweep up, you get an arch, right? Say yes or something, not, got it? And now, if you reverse it, and put the compass here and here and swing up, you get another arch, right? The two arches work together to form a what? The outline of a dome. The outline of the dome of the Knot Memorial. Isn't that beautiful? Well, I've got to now turn to a, a uh, beautiful product that uh, uh, Charlie Casey has produced. And Charlie Casey, incidentally, is not incidentally at all, has been one of the key people in bringing us together. But everyone now, take a look. <clears throat> oh. At this. Everybody got one? Any, any, those who are standing up, you don't have one. You got to get a, those who are, are standing up. Can you can you got, find one? Okay, or share. Yeah, there are a couple here and so on. He, come on, everybody got one? All right. Now, if you go to book six of Plato's Republic. Plato talks about a line. And he divides the line in the way that I've just divided the stick. But he goes one step further in that he now takes each part and divides it in the same proportion again. You follow me? So you have a this is to this, is that is to the whole, and so on. And he now gives us the allegory of the line. Allegory of the line. In four parts. A bigger part, a smaller part, a smaller part, and a finer part. And in book six, the very end of that line is the good. It is justice, it is beauty, it is one of the central forms in the Platonic concept. And each one of our arches here 
converges on that. And this is how we do that. Do it the other way around. Take a look, if you can, and find the numbers F. Do you find F, the little numbers F, on the diagonal line? Can you find them? Everybody find F, F, F? Okay. Now, if you take a look at the full span, you see how it's been divided into halves. And on the right side there, you see Plato's, the, the golden mean, first divided and the east part divided. You see that? Can you follow that? Look at the baseline, look at the baseline, and then divide it into this proportion, and then divide each part in the same proportion. I know that takes a little bit of work, but you can see them at home. But I hope many of you are finding it. Are you finding the, the three Fs? You got them? Okay. All right. Well, if you take a compass now and put the compass on the F, which is closest to the midline, follow that, and swing out to the very end of the span, that's called the entrados point, and you swing up, you mark out the entrados minor, that arch. Now, if you now take the compass and reposition it at F prime, and go back to that same point, and swing upwards, you define the entrados major. And then, you put your compass at F and go all to the outside of the main arch of its seven bouchoirs and swing up and you have defined the outer, the extrados. Now, it may take you a little bit, you can take it home and see if you can figure that out, but I hope most of you have been able to follow, follow me on that. And if, uh, if you have difficulty, give me a call and I'll work with you <laughs> further on it. But now, do you think that is an accident? Do you think they would just put the blocks up there? And there was a mind, there was a conscious mind and a knowledgeable mind that put this together for us. And incidentally, count the number of voussoirs. Those are the stones comprising this, okay? Those are seven on each side. Oh, isn't it seven again? Isn't that fun? But the stones themselves are wondrous. And I have one of them here. Here's a stone rolled in the river, and it is called Gray Wacky. Now, Kurt Holliker, you're not here. Are you here, Kurt? Oh, my God, Kurt is here. <laughs> Kurt has been one of my mentors on this building. He's been so for years and very patient with me, along with John Garver. John, you're not here, are you? I think John's away somewhere, isn't he? Sabbatical, yeah. But Kurt has been so, so useful. But this is gray wacky. Gray, G-R-E-Y, means in German, gray gray stone. But gray wacky, is a wonderful stone, and if you hold it as I had my hand, it is a symbol of union. There are million particles all united into a beautiful Brahmanda. A Brahmanda is um, an Indian name, an Asian Indian, and it means cosmic egg, cosmic egg. You cannot collect these in the seven Seven, seven, seven? Seven rivers of India without a permit. And you cannot further modify them, that is, clean them, unless you are further permitted. These are sacred objects. And so when the river falls, go out and look at the gravel. This is above lock eight. And find your very own Brahmanda. And President Harris, guess what's in your box? He has a box. Now, what does this stone say? What is its symbolism? It is produced by turbidity currents. Think of a watershed, 
Think of the thousands and thousands of sand grains being generated in that watershed. They all flow into the river, and then they flow out onto the continental shelves. And then, during a seismic activity, a major storm, these sediments are activated. They begin to slide down the continental slope. They begin to become more and more mixed with water, becoming faster and faster, some of them 40, 50 miles an hour. And then finally, after they have gathered thousands and thousands of cubic yards of sediment, they settle out on the ocean floor. And there, anywhere from a few inches to several feet can accumulate. And one of the beautiful places to see gray wacky in place is the Plotterkill Sanctuary. I don't know if any of you know the Plotterkill Sanctuary, but it is near here. It is a beautiful place. It has two beautiful waterfalls. And these waterfalls are defined by the fact that gray wacky, when it is lifted, by tectonic processes, it's very hard, and it can create the sill of the waterfall, and then the water falls off the edge. Now, there's something going on there. This gray wacky was formed, uh, what is it, uh, Oligocene, right? I don't mean Oligocene, but uh, Ordovician, right? Ordovician, 300, 400, 400 and something million years ago. 450, about 450 million years ago. That's a long time. And then it moves northward through plate tectonics, thousands of miles, and is lifted to become where we are today. I'm told, I'm not sure about that, that these movements are still continuing at the rate of which our fingernails grow. I've been here 50 years. The Union is not quite where I found it when I arrived here. <laughs> That's remarkable. But we have, uh, how am I doing for time? I'm just about out. How much? You should go to questions pretty soon. Okay, let, let, again, let me just complete this and we'll have done it. The point is, Union College Canton has a grand history, right? 400 million years old, and it has a, a, a wondrous demonstration of vital forces. Plate tectonics, right? But one final thing also, and this is where Kurt is involved, we are based on clay. If you dig down below, we have glacial Lake Albany clay. Glacial Lake Albany clay is the basis for the bricks that are in the base of this building. And so this building speaks again of, of a remarkable, remarkable story, and that is glacial Lake Albany where we now rest. So this building speaks geologically, and I think uh, one that was very worthwhile considering. Well, finally, then, uh, the building is laden with symbols. I've touched on some of them. There is much more, such as the symbolism in this magnificent pavement that we're sitting on, the encaustic tile pavement. It has a rich symbolism. The division of the illuminators into two parts. One scientific is marked with the spectrum of Newton, and on the other side, that Walter helped me define. So the building, it stands for the union of the sciences and the humanities. Another beautiful statement. Come with your binoculars to see that. I know there are more uh, items that uh, we could discuss. I'd hope to let you out by 4 o'clock, but uh, uh, Charlie won't let me do that. And so um, you want me to go to, to questions now, Charlie? All right, we have, have a few minutes for questions. Please don't ask me any hard questions. All right. Carl, I'll ask a first question about the tiles. Um, can you talk a little bit about the restoration? I understand a lot of these tiles were destroyed 
before the restoration happened. Can you talk about where we got the new ones when these are 100 years very old good. and more? Well, the, the, thank you. That's a very good point. The, the uh, tiles are remarkable. And one thing remarkable about them is that they, too, are symbolic. I'm standing here on a unique array of tiles. They form a square. You go over there, there's another one. Go over there, there's another one. Go over there, there's another one. There's a mystery one right there. Beautiful set of tiles. But you might want to walk these to see that they actually exist. But what does a square mean? A square is a basis for the golden section. I could talk with you about that further. But we lost, during the use, 10 15% of the tiles in this floor. And in the restoration, I think with John helping on that, we actually found that this type of tile was still being made in England. And we ordered our tile replacements. And you cannot tell the difference between the old tiles and the new. They are so beautifully, beautifully done. So you, you try and find it places where the old tile's here and the new tile, you won't be able to tell the difference. I, I don't think so. Does that help? Uh, oh, and President Harris? Just because it's one of my favorite pieces, can you just tell them about that tile and it's different? Oh. You don't have to go over there. Oh, sure, sure, why not? Well, one thing is right here is marked by the white. There is another one of these unusual tiles that makes the fifth tile. And they're different. Now, Edward Tuckerman Potter always puts something into the cornerstone crypt. Example, the first Dutch Reformed Church had a beautiful set of notes. When it burned, they had to restore and open the crypt. The question now is, are there hidden secrets underneath these special sets? Sounds different, doesn't it? And we haven't yet done a colonoscopy on the, <laughs> on the five of these, but there may be some wonderful answers in there that Edward Tuckerman Potter left for us. But the sad thing about this is that he, even though he did leave some good notes for the Church of the Reformed Church, we have very little information on this building. And John tells me that when Potter finally um, retired in 1904 to live in his home up in a beautiful white house in Newport. He left boxes of his materials dealing with the Knott Memorial. There was a serious leak in the roof. Is that right, John? It disappeared, that's all I know. What's that? Family threw them out. And they were thrown out. His his notes, his drawings, we have a few, we have a few here, but the rest of them are lost. And I think they were discarded. I don't think they passed on to anyone else. If anyone happens to know that, <laughs> please. Now, I have one, usually there's a wonderful answer. The stone for the Grey Wacky came from Sedgwick Quarry. I have been trying to find out where the Sedgwick quarry. Do any of you know where the Sedgwick quarry, Sedgwick quarry is here? Please tell me. Is it down by Manhattan? No, it's in our region right here. Okay. It's in this area. Because it was the same stone used in the first Dutch reform have used here. But uh, good question. And so, Dr. Harris, we don't have an answer. And uh, I uh, would love to have one. But hey, the things that uh, 
uh, Bob Uzo and Dr. Robbins and I and Walter have discovered in this building, Marty Benjamin. Incidentally, Marty Benjamin did the beautiful photograph, the black and white image, and thanks to, to Martin. You're not here today, Marty, are you? No, he's not. Yes. in Hebrew was around the Knot Memorial. Oh, say that again, dear. Around the Knot Memorial Dome. Yes. Hebrew writing, a similar saying, was around the dome. And it could be seen for blocks, blocks away from the Knot. The Hebrew writing the master is impatient, the work is much. It can, after the restoration, the Hebrew writing around the dome is no longer readable. That is something that Dr. Harris is going to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, got you. You're right. Uh, we, uh, we, we cut a few corners when he put that. Let me tell you a story about the slating, uh, and it's, it links us to Warsaw, Poland. When we put the slates and the restoration back, we used new ones, but we did not have American slaters who were competent to do the job. And so Chet Smyta, who was the chief slater, chief root man, found a team from Warsaw, Poland. Warsaw, Poland, because they had restored Warsaw, Warsaw, because the Nazis had come in and devastated the ancient city of which they were so proud. But in the process, they reestablished the slating trade. Okay? And we used those slaters to reslate the Knot Memorial. So we have an intimate linkage to Warsaw and the Slaters thereof. But in homage to another amazing woman, I want to sit down for this. <clears throat> we were about ready with great pride to show off the restored Knot Memorial. This was in 1995. 200 years later. And Pat Sinzicki, her beloved secretary in biology, pointed out that one of the whole sections was one slate off. The damn slates were one off, slate off. The slaters came in, took every slate off, put it back on in 24 hours. So that when the building was displayed for the Board of Trustees. It was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, that's it. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> So we are at our time, unfortunately, for the formal part. As I said, Professor George, I'm sure, will be happy to share with you his thoughts. And um, I just want to remark also on not only what an amazing uh, mind you have, amazing work you've done on this wonderful building, but also to reflect on you, President Roger Hall, and others, and just thank all of you for maintaining this. You know, one of the things I learned when I became president that's just shocking is that, you know, we weren't that far from tearing this beautiful place down. It was in disrepair. And so I thank all of you for making this something that we can hear Professor George talk about and actually be in that space at the same time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Oh,